Q&A time, as always, if you have questions for next week's Q&A, get them in in the comments. Thank you to everybody who commented last week. I'm gonna to try to get through as many as I can. Let's go. So at the moment for playing live and for lead playing, I use these uh, Tortex Jazz 3s. These are the little white ones that are sort of really nice to grip. It is a 1.35 millimeter version. I love the Jazz 3, I've kind of used every different version out there and uh, these are my favorites so far. But then for acoustic playing, and especially for tracking rhythm guitar in the studio, I use just these stock standard Tortex green ones, the one millimeters. As you can see, I've used this one a fair bit. I have totally worn off the little logo. So they're the picks that I like to use. Yes, I actually own a 2210. I think it's a little bit of an underrated kind of Marshall, although I think mine is due for a service. So in the next week or two, I'm taking around to my tech and getting it sorted out. So there will be some fresh demo videos of the 2210, but you can check it out compared to a JCM 800 2203 in one of my older videos. And then I've just got like a standalone walkthrough video with it. So check those out as well. Okay, I checked in the Soldano in the preamp section, I've got a mix of electro harmonics and JJ tubes. I think it's like V4 and 5 are EHX and the other three, the first three positions are JJ tubes. And then I have got some Svetlana 5881s. I think there's Svetlana in there uh, from memory. So yeah, sort of like uh, Eastern European made uh, new old stock tubes and they definitely make a difference. I think that's why that amp, uh, part of why that amp sounds so good. Never played a Makati 594, but I do own a Makati that I absolutely love. And I did, when I bought my single cut, I remember trying out at the time they had like the uh, 58 single cut or it was something like that, uh, 5708 pickups and stuff like that. And I greatly, greatly preferred uh, just the sort of stock sounded SC245 to those. Uh, maybe it was just the particular guitars that I tried, but uh, yeah, I remember picking up that SC245, like strumming one chord in it and basically going to the person working there. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna buy this guitar. And he was like, do you wanna like plug it into an amp and maybe check that it works? And uh, just the more I played it, the more I immediately fell in love with it. So that was kind of like a bit of a unicorn, that guitar, but I would love to try a Makati 594. It's sort of like my, uh, favorite combination of specs for that kind of guitar. So it'd be interesting to see how it stacks up to the 245 and to the Makati that I own. And to the people who noticed, yes, that is a Hamer Chaparral. It's from about 1990 or 91, I believe. It's got a set neck. It's not a Californian. I do own a Californian Elite, which has a bolt-on neck with 27 frets, also made in the USA. Uh, I really like those older Hamer guitars. If you can get your hands on a USA-made Hamer, do it because they're fantastic instruments. And funnily enough, that Hamer Chaparral that I own was painted by Perry Ormsby from Ormsby Guitars. And he did a really, really great job with that, like super detailed airbrushing stuff. So uh, yeah, well done Hamer, well done Perry. I feel like I've had a few sort of breakthrough game-changing moments. Uh, the first one was watching Paul Gilbert's uh, Hot Licks video, I think, or REH video, whoever made it, uh, which I just never heard anybody sort of play that aggressively. So that was a big game-changing moment for me. And I wanna say that the, probably the biggest game-changing moment for me in terms of just overall musicianship is trying to learn how to sing. And I uh, definitely do not consider myself a singer uh, at all, but it's just sort of been this like ongoing process where 10 years ago, I could not hold the tune to save my life. And now I'm at the stage where I can sort of without too much stress, do guide vocals on uh, original stuff and then, you know, send it to the person who's going to sing it so that they can have an idea to do it. So, uh, yeah, just kind of learning the basics of singing and what's going on and you know, how hard that is and how even average singers put in so much work just to sound like that. Whereas we can just basically get like a Les Paul, tune it to drop D, plug it into a Marshall and go gang, 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 gang. And it sounds pretty good. So learning to sing, I think, which is an ongoing thing for me, like I said, but it's uh, definitely the best thing you can ever do as a musician. So do it, you know, even if you only ever sing in the shower, uh, just do it and try to embrace it. And, you know, don't be one of those people that's like, oh, I've got a terrible voice, like, I'll never be able to do it because I have a terrible voice. Nearly everybody thinks they have a terrible voice. Great singers think they have terrible voices. Just do it and it will improve your overall musicianship. And I found that when it comes to like, you know, simple stuff like phrasing on the guitar, if I just try to sing the line, then I find that it comes out so much better. So yeah, definitely from a musical standpoint, uh, learning to sing or at least trying to sing or learning to try how to sing. Trying to learn how to sing? So. 
Brass blocks for Floyds I have not tried, but I have got a strat with a Callahan uh, big brass block on it and I definitely notice that it sort of sustains and resonates a bit better. So I'm a big fan of the brass on strats and bands that have influenced me that are not ragdoll, uh, I guess it's a bit hard to be influenced by your own band anyway. So uh, in terms of influence, man, like I feel like I get this question every week. So rather than talk about that, uh, here's a couple of bands that you should check out that I think you would really, really dig. Uh, check out a band from the early 90s called Cry of Love if you're sort of like bluesy hard rock. They're really good. Uh, check out uh, a band called Burning Rain, which was Doug Aldrich's band from the 90s. Really, really great band again. Uh, check out a band called King's X. I always recommend King's X. Get their Dogman album and Gretchen Goes to Nebraska because uh, that's been a huge influence on what I like to do. What other weird stuff do I really like that's kind of influenced me and sort of rubbing off at the moment? Uh, get the first album by a UK prog band called UK, which has Alan Holdsworth on it. I absolutely adore that album. And get into a band called Budgie. Now, I was telling one of my students about them today and they were a really, really great three-piece, super underrated. Uh, just, yeah, get all their albums and listen to it because they were a big influence on me growing up. Well, I don't have any concrete thoughts about the Moore preamp live other than what I've seen. I've kind of watched most of the videos that are out at the moment from the big YouTube guys. And for me, I really like their micro preamps. Like, I went and ordered their little Friedman micro preamp pedal, so stick around for that demo because I picked up one of those cheap and I really want to check it out. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's sort of like a no-brainer. Like, it's got all their preamp models in there, which sound really, really good. And then it does preamp matching, so kind of like a Kemper style, kind of like an Axe FX tone match sort of thing. And for the money, it looks really good. So uh, yeah, Muo, if you want to send me one and get me to demo it, I'll totally do it. Otherwise, I might just go out and pick one up if you guys are keen to hear one. Uh, it seems like for the money, it's pretty hard to beat. So I might just... Uh, go on eBay or something like that and pick one up and try it out and do some demo stuff, see how it stacks up to the axe. Multi-scale fretboards, I think, are pretty cool. I've got a little prototype guitar here that uh, actually my dad made with a multi-scale board on it. I'll grab it and show you. So this thing is a total Frankenstein. Um, I wanted to build a gem about <laughs> 15 years ago, so I cut this body out of mahogany, as you can see. There, so there's this gem body that never got used, and then it's like a Kramer Night Swan knockoff uh, but yeah, it's very, very cool. The thing that I like about multi-scales is when you're playing down this end of the fretboard, uh, it kind of follows the contour of like, and the angle of your hand and your wrist. So as you play up high, your fingers go this way and it fans across, which is really nice. So I think that's the main thing. And in terms of like the feel, um, it feels really natural. Like, Uh, I find it takes like five minutes to adjust. So uh, if you're thinking about getting a multi-scale guitar, just, just do it and try it out because I think they're very, very comfortable. Everybody talks about the advantages with like string tension and intonation and stuff, but for me, it's just a comfort thing. I think they're very ergonomic. I am into flat picking on acoustics. I'm just totally rubbish at it. I've not practiced it enough. And um, I was actually telling one of my students about, uh, I think it's Molly Tuttle. Like Troy Grady has a thing with her flat picking and it's just, it's one of those things that I watch that makes me want to quit guitar. So uh, yeah, I'm a terrible flat picker, but I think it's an amazing technique. And if you've never heard about flat picking, Troy Grady's Cracking the Code breaks it down really well. So go and check that out. His stuff's always really good. Favorite Star Wars film? Am I gonna like alienate, you know, one third of my uh, viewer base just by picking the wrong film? Uh, no, but honestly, uh, obviously I love the original trilogy. I had that on VHS. That was one of those sort of uh, life-changing things when one of my friends was like, have you ever seen Star Wars? Probably when I was about 10 and I was like, no. And then we watched all the Star Wars films like every day, you know, for about a year. So I'm definitely an Empire guy. I love how dark that movie is. I think the character construction and everything like that is the best out of all the movies. So I'm definitely an Empire guy. Although I will say, when I was a kid and I went and saw The Phantom Menace, it blew my mind. So if you asked me this question not too long ago, I would have told you that. And out of the newer ones, I actually think I really like Rogue One. That one kind of just hit all the sweet spots for me. I was into that, didn't mind The Force Awakens. The Last Jedi, I thought the bits of it that were good were some of the best Star Wars bits ever. Like the fight scene is my favorite Star Wars fight scene ever. I think that's really good. but. Uh, yeah, I'm not kind of going to delve into that too much because you'll probably get a bunch of like pop-up videos about 
how Disney ruined Star Wars, oh my god! But uh, yeah, anyway, Empire is the best. This is like the ultimate question that people in other bands ask us. Um, and it used to really put me offside, like, why would I want to add another guitar player? Uh, but uh, a little bit of uh, a detour, when Ragdoll started, we were actually a five-piece. Before we were even called Ragdoll, this was kind of the concept of the band. And we had a dedicated lead singer, and we had a dedicated bass player, and Ryan, who's now the singer and bass player, was actually playing rhythm guitar in the band. So his role was kind of like co-lead vocals. He mostly sang backing vocals and played rhythm guitar. And uh, then my buddy Mike McCullough, who's now in a band called Auditory, who are fantastic. If you like what Ragdoll does, go and check out the Auditory stuff. They've got a couple of singles out and they're releasing more music. And I'm super into what he's doing. He's a monster muso and songwriter. So check them out. But yeah, anyway, we did that. We cut a demo and then uh, the bass player left. So Ryan kind of moved over to bass. And then we parted ways with the singer and Ryan became the lead singer. And thankfully, because, yeah, it was just one of those kind of situations where anytime he would sing a song, you know, nearly everybody in the audience would come up to us afterwards and go, wow, you need to let that guy sing more songs. And um, he, when I initially heard Ryan sing, I was like, man, I need to be in a band with that guy. And uh, we ended up in this five piece and then this four piece and then this three piece. And then very briefly, uh, we did a few shows with a rhythm guitar player and that one didn't work out either so we just kind of stuck with the three-piece thing so we've considered it and we've tried it and back then we were playing a very different style of music we were far more 80s influenced and i found that sort of being in a three-piece presents this big challenge about how do you make it sound big alive and out of that my whole approach to building guitar sounds and my whole approach to building guitar parts has changed and evolved so much that uh, i just really can't see there would be no space for another guitar player, either on the recordings or live. I would much rather, if we were gonna play with other musicians, add like a keyboard player or something like that, uh, or a percussionist, just something out of left field rather than another guitar player, because I feel that the way that I write parts and the way that we write and arrange music just sort of fits so well in a three piece. The other massive factor as well is the way Ryan plays bass and his bass tone, he's got this like ginormo bass tone like he uses a sans amp and distortion and stuff like that so uh and just sort of the way he plays with cam together it's sort of this thing where it's like it it just wouldn't make sense to have another musician in there because everything is so structured around making it work as a three piece and part of that structure is leaving space and having a lot of rhythmic syncopation so uh, it's very easy to be tight as a three piece as well i hope that answers the question no experience with the PRS Archon. I'm sure a lot of people call it the Archon, but I believe the correct pronunciation is Archon. Uh, if I didn't get that right, you know, tell me in the comments. But the only experience I've had with it is in the Waves PRS plugin, and I thought it sounded really good as a plugin. It's one of those bucket list amps that I really want to try. It's one of those amp models that I really hope gets added to the Axe FX3, uh, just because, yeah, it's a pretty slamming amp in all the... Uh, clips that I've heard and then Mark Tremonti MT15 is another amp I would love to try from PRS as well because uh, I know Mark's a guy who likes the Bogner Uberschall and the Messer Rectifier and I love those amps so that sounds like a dream amp as well. Sheet music, no sheet music for the songs but if people would like sheet music for the songs I can definitely go away and do some of that although so many of the things and so many of the parts that I write and put together are sort of so weird that it would take me so long to actually be able to sit down and go, okay, cool, what did I actually play on the recording? And the other thing is transcribing solos. So uh, a lot of the solos that I play in the studio are like, I'll do 20 takes and just keep the one that I like and I can never remember how to play it. So uh, maybe that'll be a project over the rest of the year and into the new year. Uh, and there is a new album in the works. We've actually just, uh, yesterday we had a big session where we put down a bunch of um, demo vocals for everything and it's sounding really good. So we're probably like, We've tracked drums for six songs so far, and I've done guitars for three or four songs. So it's slowly getting there. Hopefully the middle of next year it should be out, and I will definitely consider the guitar sheet music thing if that's something that would interest you guys, because uh, it's something I'd love to do, but it's obviously if no one's gonna, if no one's gonna check it out, I'm not gonna spend hours and hours doing it uh, when, you know, I could just be like playing guitar. 
eating Nutella from the jar, all those kind of things. Okay, there is a couple of things that personally I would like out of the Axe FX that is missing. One thing is more base amps. Uh, there's only a couple of base models and a couple of drives. I would love a Sans amp model in there because I think that's really cool. And then stuff like the Ampeg Portaflex, uh, the GK stuff, the Trace Elliott stuff. I feel like if they added like maybe five or six more base amps and a couple of base specific drive pedals, I know there's a dark glass stuff in there which is really great, uh, that that would really round it out. Like I said earlier, the PRS Archon would be really cool. And for me, most of the time, it's just kind of like very subtle improvements. Like, um, I haven't tried the foot controller yet, but I'm really, really excited to try one out when, whenever they get released. So I think that having that with the X3 will so solve a lot of the, uh, not problems, but like things that I feel like I'm missing, like being able to use the looper with my feet and stuff like that and being able to like get the most out of channels and scene changes all from the foot controller. So it's not that they haven't added it, it's just that, you know, that particular product isn't released yet. So I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, yeah, other than that, it would be really nice if it could drive me to the gig. So once they add an AI and like a, you know, one of those kind of Google smart cars that you can just put your Axe FX in and it will drive you to the gig, that will be the ultimate. Thanks so much for checking out the video. Again, if you want to support the channel, you can go and buy my music. Check out Ragdoll's Back to Zero album. You guys have been great. I will see you next week. Get your questions in the comments below.